So before I get really into what are mineral accretion devices, I want to kind of just set the stage about why do we need them. Um, like many of our coral restoration techniques, you know, they, there's a whole consortium of threats to coral reefs. Um, we can see the direct threats, the localized threats from, you know, wastewater and diving and overfishing and, and habitat destruction and all these things. Uh, but when we talk about the mineral accretion, what we want to more focus on, it does help with some of those things. But what we want to focus on are the global threats. So we're going to talk a bit more about things like climate change and coral bleaching. And as you can see in this photo, coral bleaching is a very significant problem for reefs around the world. Um, in the photo on the left um, is Chilok Ban Khao in, on, in Thailand, and we can see beautiful corals. Um, and then in the summer of 2014, all those corals went white. And if we go to the next slide here, you'll see, unfortunately, most of those corals didn't make it. And so today, what we have is a dead reef. And this is a direct result of climate change. And we're going to talk a little about coral bleaching. So hopefully you guys are all, you know, because you're here, kind of um, familiar with, with corals and, and how the holobion um, is, you know, the coral tissue, the animal it is a jellyfish-like organism that has an exoskeleton that, that we see as that solid kind of limestone coral. Um, and that coral tissue is full of these unicellular algae called zooxanthellae. So when we have a healthy holobion, we have the coral tissue um, on top of its skeleton, and it's full of these zooxanthellae. They're providing 70 to 90% of the coral's metabolic energy input, taking energy from the sun, converting it into sugars and, and lipo lipids, and giving that to the coral, and that's where it gets most of its energy. But if water conditions change, uh, with thermal bleaching when they warm up, then that mutualistic symbiosis starts to break down. The coral starts to become an uninhabitable, uninhabitable environment for the zooxanthellae. And the zooxanthellae start producing more free radicals like hydrogen peroxide that attacks the coral. So they'll become in competition with each other and the coral usually wins out by expelling or digesting the zooxanthellae. But now the coral is left in a state where it doesn't get 70 to 80% of its metabolic daily input of energy. Um, it's also much more susceptible to threats. It's stressed out. It's going to you know, be likely to get diseased or, or can't produce mucus to slough off sediment and these kind of things. So we end up with dead coral um, and that eventually gets covered over in filamentous algae. So that's what coral bleaching is. Um, to give you a little history of it now. So coral bleaching um, is a natural phenomenon, of course. Um, it's always happened to some degree on the coral reefs. If we look at, you know, the, the early history, we look into the scientific literature, we can find isolated reports of coral bleaching between 1900 and 1979. But generally these are in like tide pools or there's a couple of corals um, you know, of, of, of a single species that go at, you know, the lowest tide of the year or something like that. But in 1979, 1980, we have the first report um, of what was known as mass coral bleaching. So rather than just one species of coral or a couple corals in the tidal pool, this was a lot of different species of corals across a wide range of the reef. So um, this we termed as a mass coral bleaching event. And that was the first one in 1979, 1980. That was on the Great Barrier Reef. Then only a short time later in 1998, we had the first global mass coral bleaching event. So this was not just, you know, multiple species across a wide swath of reef. This was reefs all around the world bleaching. And in 1998, we lost 16% of the world's hard corals. That's a lot, you know, that's a, almost a fifth of our corals went away in a single year. And most people have never even heard of that. I mean, if I think if it was the rainforest that disappeared 16% in a single year, we would all know about it. We would all be very concerned about it. Um, but, you know, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. Most people don't even know what coral bleaching is. So it's kind of hard to explain to them that, you know, they should be concerned about it. So we look forward, 2002 was a bad year. 2004 was a bad year for many reefs. 2006, another mass bleaching year. And then 2010, 
we had another global event. And then it didn't take long before 2014 and 17, we had a three year mass coral bleaching event, the first of its kind. And during that time, about 50% of the corals on the Great Barrier Reef, by the end of that, 50% um, of the Great Barrier Reef was gone. I think it was actually about 20 to 30% in that time period, but it led up to the 50% that we now report today for the Great Barrier Reef. So bleaching incidents are natural. However, mass coral bleaching and global mass coral bleaching events, we don't think are that, nat are that natural or they shouldn't be so frequent. What we're seeing is that an increase in both the frequency and severity of these events. And this combined with all the other human related problems, um, habitat destruction, declining water quality and everything else is leading to major issues with our global coral populations. But it's not the only problem, of course. Um, the other problem that comes about with climate change, in addition to warming oceans, is more acidic oceans. So the pH of the oceans is actually going down. And this happens for several reasons, but the main one is that we get more CO2 dissolving into the ocean water. Um, the oceans are our largest sink of CO2 globally. Something like 22 million tons of CO2 enters into our oceans every year. And so if it wasn't for our oceans, you know, when we think about the industrial revolution and all the pollution we put into the atmosphere, um, it doesn't stay in the atmosphere. If it did, we'd look like Venus right now. Most of that does go back into the oceans and there it forms carbonic acid. Um, so let's talk about ocean acidification a bit. So when we have like a glass of water and it's sitting on a table, it'll tend to be in equilibrium with the air as far as its gas can content goes. So it, it'll be like 21% oxygen and, and all that within it. However, water absorbs CO2 much faster than it absorbs oxygen. Also, warmer water can hold less oxygen and more CO2. So we are just to go to like a mountain stream and test the cold, quickly running mountain stream, we would find it's 100% saturated with oxygen. Um, if we follow that stream down to where it became a large slow moving river, we would find that once it warms up, it has, and it's not so turbid, it has a lot more um, CO2. So when ocean waters warm up, they can hold more CO2, but we're also putting more CO2 into the atmosphere. So these two effects compound. And as we put these you know, acids, the carbonic acid from carbon dioxide into the, into the oceans, that is going to affect the, the buffering of the water and it's going to deplete the amount of carbonate salts that we have. So it's basically a, an acid base reaction. Hopefully you guys are all familiar with these kind of like one of the more simple reactions we have in chemistry. And if, if you're American, I, I guess Europeans don't do it that much, but American, if you were a kid in, in school, you definitely did a, a um, vinegar and baking soda volcano at some point um, in your science class. And you saw the way that um, when you mixed an acid like vinegar with a base like baking soda, then you got this reaction that produced salt and water. So, you know, nothing dangerous. Um, and as we can see this in like the limestone, you know, in other cases like the limestone statues around that have been around, you know, since the Roman era. And now with increased incidence of nitrous oxide and, and sulfur dioxide in the atmospheres, these are starting to be affected by acid rain and dissolved, as you can see in that picture on the right there. So we can actually see this, how this works in our oceans. We have this balance between the bases, which we would call aragonite, these alkaline minerals, calcium carbonate, the things like limestone and the things that um, corals make their skeleton out of. And we can see how that concentrations are affected based on the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide. So at the moment, um, so we look at the first one, like 280 is the parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That was pre-industrial revolution. Um, and so we can see this big blue area. That's where we get aragonite depositing. So it, it's in such high abundance concentrations that it can actually deposit. And if we look at that map, we understand that's where a lot of the world's coral reefs are. Um, and also like oyster reefs and things like that. 
Um, now, when I made this graph that I should update, um, we were at 380. Um, but now, today, we're at 415 parts per million of carbon dioxide. Once we start increasing um, the concentration of carbon dioxide, it reduces the amount of the alkaline minerals, like aragonite, that can form. And so as we look at those graphs, we see less and less of the blue areas and much more of the yellow and red areas where we're getting not into the deposition of limestone, um, but the dissolution of it. And a lot of the times people ask, well, yeah, but doesn't ocean pH change all the time? Um, and, and yes, to some degree it does. But if we look back, you know, 25 million years, we find that it's always between the range of 8 and 8.3. So the ocean waters are alkaline. And if we were to extend this graph back even further, we would still find that the ocean waters are alkaline. And that's why we find today that most of our organisms, like corals, sponges, mollusks, they all build their skeletons and their, their structure out of alkaline minerals because those are what are abundant in the water to utilize. So that's how corals make their skeleton, how a, how a snail makes its shell is using these alkaline minerals, right? Um, but when we look at what's going on today, um, we can see that that pH is gonna drop very, very quickly. It already is dropping quickly and it looks, you know, it, it's, it's unprecedented to see this kind of change in our Earth's um, oceans and, and atmosphere. Um, unfortunately, that's what, what we're doing. So this affects the living corals, um, but it also primarily affects corals and other organisms when they're in their most vulnerable stage, which is their larval stage. Um, you know, corals, they're not taken care of by their parents like we, like we do or elephants or other higher order animals. They have our strategy reproduction, which means they put out tons of eggs and sperm and let them do their own thing, let them survive on their own. So they're given some lipids, like an egg, you know, it, it's full of these fats and nutrients. And that's what the juvenile lives off of for a very long time in its, its early life stage. Well, what we find is when oceans are more acidic, when waters are more acidic, um, as in this graph here from Albright, in some experiments she did with coral larvae, um, when we increase the amount of CO2 in the water, much less of these coral larvae are able to make it to the metamorphous stage to settle down. And those that do settle down are much less likely to survive. Um, so even with settlement, um, once they do settle down, they have to put down that first base layer of calcium carbonate to glue them to the surface and start to create their skeleton. And if they're in acidic, more acidic waters, then that becomes a lot more of an energy investment to do so. And so much fewer, many fewer of them would be able to do that. Um, so when ocean waters change in their CO2 concentration by just a you know, relatively small amount, we see that we get decreased larval survival, settlement, metabolism, and growth. Um, so not only are we losing you know, through a coral bleaching, um, the adult corals, the, the ones that who are building the reef and providing the habitat for all the organisms that live there, but we also lose the, the ability to replace them if they die from like a bleaching event. So, and I promise I don't have too much more depressing stuff to go through. <laughs> but um, so here's some, some pictures from the USGS that I just want to use because I think they really illustrate this point. This is from the Caribbean. Um, and I'm covered up here, but I think this is in the 1970s. I can't see because of my Zoom thing here. But um, so this is in the 1970s. This is a bunch of Acropora coral in the Caribbean. Um, what they call like staghorn and elkhorn coral. And then here is a large parietes coral. Um, and we can see that, you know, there's very good coverage. Um, but what happened in this area in the 1970s was an outbreak of a coral disease. Um, and so what happened by the 1980s, that coral disease primarily affected the Acropora. So now we see that Acropora is gone. Um, and we also in the 80s had a disease in the Caribbean that wiped out a lot of the diaderma, the sea urchins. So there's no sea urchins to consume a lot of the algae 
So that algae starts to take over the reef. Um, and once that algae covers over all this coral rubble, it's very hard for new larvae to come and settle down here and be successful. Luckily, our, our parietes is still there. But here's what I want you to do. So we lost our coral from the disease, but now you see all of this dead coral here. Let's look at what happens in another 10 years. Boom. So all that dead coral has gone, right? We've got sand patches now and it, it looks deeper. I don't know if that's because of the tide. Um, it could be, um, it's hard to know with photographs, but it could also be that, you know, a lot of this is just dissolving. It's, it's being broken down mechanically and also chemically. And we see a lot more macroalgae around here. Um, and our, our parietes coral has also gotten away by this time. And once we get to this stage, you know, if you were a coral polyp coming to settle here, there's a lot of competition from fast growing algae. There's not much clean substrate to settle on. And there's not even that much stable substrate to settle on. So we can jump forward another 10 years. It's no longer a coral reef ecosystem that we have there. So I, I, I wish I could tell you this was an isolated incident, that this was something that only happened in this series of photographs, but unfortunately, this is the Caribbean. Um, the Caribbean, 90% of the corals of the Caribbean have been lost already.